Many people still get chills down their spine just thinking about Al Capone. His name conjures up memories of gangster times, violent killings, and carnage. He was also called Scarface and was responsible for a number of murders, most notably the baseball bat murders. 80 years later, Al Capone continues to represent the ability of criminals to influence politicians and law enforcement, making him a symbol of American culture. To find out why Al Capone turned out to be a famous gangster, let's see his life history. Around the turn of the century, Al Capone's father moved to the United States, where he opened a barber shop. The family Al Capone was among the immigrants arriving in the United States. His family settled in the least wealthy neighborhood into a reasonably priced home. Alphonse Gabriel Capone was born on January 17, 1899, in a filthy Brooklyn tenement where Gabriel Capone and his wife, Terencina, had relocated with their two boys. Brooklyn was an immigrant and impoverished person's city. There were many organized criminal rackets since people could make a living by doing anything. As a low-class immigrant, Al Capone worked for small-time criminal organizations as a petty thief. He was breaking and entering ever since he was younger than 14 years old. His grammar school expelled him for striking a teacher in the face. He belonged to a large number of street gangs. He performed well enough to join the Five Points Group, the largest and most robust in New York. He became a famous mobster from these little thefts, and prohibition played an essential part. Al Capone joined a gang led by Johnny Torrio, where Lucky Luciano, who would become famous in his own right, was already a member. At the latter's invitation, Capone joined Torrio in 1920, having grown to be a powerful lieutenant in the Colosimo gang. The unlawful brewing, distilling, and distribution of beer and spirits, which were the Prohibition Amendment's offshoots, were considered growth industries. Torrio planned to seize this industry, with Al Capone by his side. The mob also fostered ties with amenable public officials, labor unions, and employee associations, forming stakes in legal cleaning and dying businesses. With Big Jim Colosimo's brutal death, Torrio quickly assumed complete command of the gang, and Capone developed experience and skills as his reliable right arm. When Torrio gave up leadership and withdrew to Brooklyn in 1925, after suffering severe injuries in an assassination attempt, Capone took over. In the brutal gang wars of the era, Capone had established a formidable reputation by fighting for and winning the racketeering rights in several parts of Chicago. As competing gangs were vanquished or declared invalid, Cicero, a suburb, effectively became the mob's fief. This notoriety flourished. One of the bloodiest gang fights in history is thought to have occurred on St. Valentine's Day. It is also regarded as one of Al Capone's most heinous deeds, demonstrating his danger. The massacre exposed his ruthlessness and unwavering dominance as a mobster. Unquestionably, Al Capone controlled the South Side, while the Irish North Side gang controlled the local supply of premium whiskey and good beer. The gang's refusal to relocate some of these distilleries from the north side to the south side led to tensions between the two organizations, which eventually resulted in the infamous Capone assassination attempt in 1962. More than a thousand rounds were fired at a hotel where Al Capone was having dinner by north sider George Bugs Moran and his men. Amazingly, Capone emerged unscathed but with a solid determination for exact retribution. For a variety of reasons, including his Catholic faith, Moran openly detested Capone and the prostitution ring that helped fund the South Side crime syndicate. Four guys broke into the SMC Cartage Co. garage, which Moran employed for his illicit operation at around 10.30 a.m. Two of the males had on police uniforms, presumably announcing a raid. The quartet instructed the seven guys inside the garage to form a walk line formation. Then they started shooting. The rat-a-tat staccato of submachine guns startled witnesses, and they watched as the shooters drove off in a black Cadillac touring car, equipped with a gong, siren, and weapon rack, like the kind the police used. Among the dead were Frank Hawk Gusenberg, Moran's enforcer, and his brother Peter Goosey Gusenberg, who were either shot dead or left to die in the garage. The seventh person to die was Dr. Reinhardt Schwimmer, an optometrist who enjoyed gambling with criminals. The other four victims were Moran gangsters. Capone's prize, Moran, slept in that morning and missed it. 
Even Capone was missing the thrill. While on vacation at his resort in Palm Island, Florida, he denied knowing anything about the cold-blooded murders and provided an alibi for his movements. Not many people accepted it. The chilling tale of Scarface's murders doesn't stop here. Next are the infamous baseball bat murders. This gripping event, depicted in numerous movies, captured worldwide attention. Al Capone's baseball murder remains a haunting memory for many. In 1929, Joseph Juno Junta had conspired to kill Al Capone, and he had the help of two hitmen, Albert Anselmi and John Scalise, who had previously worked for Capone in the Chicago outfit and had killed Dean O'Banion. After rising to the position of Union Siciliana president, Junta attempted to depose Capone and take over the Chicago crime scene. Capone, suspicious of the betrayal but not wanting to act violently for once, hatched a scheme to confirm the details. Confronted by Anselmi and Scalise, Capone faked a confrontation with his bodyguard, Frankie Rio, to obtain confirmation of the devious plan. Rio, who initially seemed involved, eventually told Capone about the danger. Capone ended up murdering all of his associates who were about to betray him. And the weapon of choice? A baseball bat. American lawman Elliot Ness, the Untouchables leader, is credited with stopping Al Capone. The fact is that Elliot Ness did not bring down Al Capone by himself. Under Elliot Ness's direction, the Untouchables were special agents of the U.S. Bureau of Prohibition, who between 1930 and 1932 vigorously enforced prohibition laws against Al Capone's organization to stop his illicit activities. Known for his fearlessness and incorruptibility, they were dubbed the Untouchables when a few of their agents turned down substantial payments from Chicago Outfit members. During the first six months of operation, Ness and his men seized six large breweries and 19 distilleries, costing Capone more than $1 million. An agent for Capone offered Ness $2,000 a week to stop the raids, but he refused. After kicking the men out, Ness said at a press conference that his team would not be bought off. Following their 1930 press conference, a Chicago reporter called them the Untouchables. Ness's use of the Chicago press was crucial to his efforts against Capone. After gathering evidence with Ness and his Untouchables, Capone was indicted in June 1931 on 5,000 conspiracy charges to violate the Volstead Act after an earlier indictment for income tax evasion. After George Johnson consented to suggest a sentence of two plus two years, Capone entered a guilty plea to all charges. However, federal judge James H. Wilkerson rejected Johnson's plea deal and proceeded with the tax case trial when Capone altered his request. Even though Capone would never face prosecution for the prohibition allegations, the federal government used the indictment as the foundation for a tax lawsuit when Capone was found guilty of evading income taxes. Throughout and after Capone's trial, Ness and the Untouchables continued targeting the outfit's beer and spirits empire, causing an estimated $9 million in lost revenue. Due to his efforts, Ness was promoted to chief investigator of the Prohibition Bureau of Chicago in 1932. The Untouchables had disintegrated by then, although Ness would organize raids against outfit distilleries and breweries until Prohibition was lifted in 1933. That's all for today's video. If you'd like us to cover your favorite gangster next, let us know in the comments below. And as always, stay safe out there.